Okay. So Frank, thank you so much for uh, being here with me today. Um, my first question for you, could you just tell me a little bit about your role at Mercy Health? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for having me. So, um, so I'm a rheumatologist here at uh, Mercy Health. Um, uh, I see mostly uh, patients in the office. Uh, we deal with autoimmune diseases. Uh, you know, the area that this ties in with ticks and mosquitoes is that uh, sometimes the presenting symptoms with some of the uh, diseases that these uh, you know, ticks and mosquitoes can spread or, or joint issues. So that's how they kind of end up with me sometimes. Awesome. So my first question um, on the ticks, like you mentioned, um, when and where are they most active um, during, like during the summer? So yeah, they're, they're most active certainly during the summer and uh, like May and June uh, usually is when they're most active uh, into July, they start to become less so, but really, you know, throughout the summer um and uh you know wooded areas is, is typically where uh they're most prevalent but uh you know uh people pick up ticks uh in you know in their yard or on the porch even but wooded areas are kind of where you see them the most and then what do they usually look like for someone that hasn't ever encountered them i had one when, when i was little so i know exactly <laughs> what they look like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, so actually, a lot of times, uh, you know, when we diagnose patients with Lyme disease, is, is kind of the main thing we think of with ticks. Uh, a lot of times, you never actually see it because it's the uh, the nymph forms that you know mostly transmit it. The adults do too, but a lot of times, the the adults uh, you can see because they're bigger. So the nymphs, because they're small, a lot of times that's what transmits Lyme disease because you never see them because they're so little. But when you do see them, they're usually, you know, they look like little black bugs. Uh, if they've been on you long enough, they because they do feed on blood, they can become engorged. Um, and uh, they do sometimes try to hide in sensitive areas. So even when you're outside, if you get a tick and it gets on your arm or your leg, a lot of times they will crawl around a little bit to find uh, a softer spot before they actually bite you. And then um, could you tell me... Um, a bit about Lyme disease and what exactly that is and um, what it presents as, like what people like come yeah. to. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so Lyme disease is, um, uh, it's a spirochete bacteria that's transmitted um, from the, from the ticks. Um, they, uh, they usually get it from the host is, is from the white footed mouse. So that's what is the reservoir for the infection itself. Uh, the deer that spread it are often called deer ticks because they, they like deer, but the deer is actually not um, what, uh, what harbors the, uh, the Lyme disease itself. Uh, but with the increased deer population, there's more ticks. So that's kind of where that, you know, kind of ties in, even though they get it from the mouse. But uh, mm -hmm. the infection itself, uh, like I said, is a, is a bacteria called uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, and uh, sometimes we will see a uh, target rash or a bullseye rash. Uh, that's uh, a lot of times the, the common presenting symptom, but not everyone gets that. Um, and then there are kind of phases to, uh, to the, you know, the infection there. So um, there can be early localized infection, which um, you know, usually happens shortly after a tick bite. Uh, it's a lot of times will be that target rash that we see and you know kind of non-specific symptoms like uh you know fever fatigue muscle aches joint aches those sorts of things um we can then have early disseminated disease which will sometimes have that target rash not just in the area that the bite occurred but it will be more diffuse uh and we can sometimes see more severe neurologic manifestations at that point too sometimes we see like a bell's palsy where you can have uh, you know, facial droop on one side. Um, if it is allowed to persist long enough that we get into late disease, it sometimes can actually affect some of the uh, electrical mechanisms in the heart. It can have more severe neurologic manifestations. And uh, once it gets to the late phase, uh, where we kind of tie in in rheumatology too, is sometimes it can cause an inflammatory arthritis, where it's rather than just, you know, joint aches and muscle aches, uh, it's, you know, big swollen joints. And usually it's the knee joint that it likes. 
Um, but it can have a lot of different manifestations actually, you know, kind of depending on the, the course of the disease there. Yeah. That, I didn't know any, like that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, it's uh, it's pretty extensive, and and you know, uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of different manifestations we can see with it, and a lot of them are non-specific that you can see with other things too. So you know, it sometimes you know is a difficult diagnosis, and you know, sometimes like I said, some of these late manifestations, uh, you know, the bite itself could have happened you know months or even. Uh, you know, a year or two sometimes before you have symptoms. So even though we think of the summer, if you have mm -hmm. symptoms in the winter, it doesn't mean that it can't be, you know, from Lyme disease or a tick bite. And, you know, it may have occurred in the summer and you're just kind of now having the manifestations. Wow. That, yeah, that's really cool to learn. Yeah. But yeah. so just kind of like taking all of that, if somebody gets bit, you would just say like, if, if there's rash, definitely go to the doctor. If you have these symptoms, go to the doctor. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, if if you if you see a tick, um, you know, uh, it's it's, you know, good to if you can get into your primary care doctor early, if not, you know, in urgent care, um, because if we catch that early, a lot of times we can give you a, just a single dose of doxycycline, and that will kind of nip it in the bud and, and kind of, you know, prevent it from progressing there. Um, if it gets you know further along or like i said a lot of times you actually don't see the tick um so if it gets further along into the you know early and late disseminated uh then it is kind of a longer uh you know a longer course of antibiotics there depending you know on the manifestation so certainly if you see a tick uh you know absolutely you you want to get you know you want to get checked out there uh but a lot of times you won't see it so sometimes some of these more non-specific you know manifestations you want to at least see your primary doctor you know whether it turns out to be lyme or not but uh a lot of these things that we can see are kind of non-specific so sometimes it's a difficult diagnosis diagnosis to make. So, uh, you know, certainly the target rash, that's one of the more specific things. Um, but, you know, more nonspecific things like fever for, you know, uh, an unknown reason, uh, you know, joint aches, muscle aches, certainly, like I said, as it gets further along, something like facial droop, I mean, you want to go to the emergency room for that anyway, and, you know, people have stroke, but, you know, any of those more severe manifestations is, is uh, you know, when you want to go see your doctor. Yeah. And then kind of um, shifting over to mosquitoes a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the precautions that um, you'd recommend just like protecting against like mosquitoes and like diseases that they could carry? Because I know yeah. that that's a really broad question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. So, um, you know, the, the biggest thing is, you know, uh, try to cover your skin up. So if you're going to be, you know, uh, in areas where there's mosquitoes, again, getting towards wooded areas, uh, they tend to be a little more active, you know, kind of at dusk, you want to wear, you know, long sleeves, long pants, if you can, um, and really kind of preventing them in, in the first place. So their breeding grounds are standing water. So trying to eliminate any standing water is, is, is the big thing. Um, and then, um, you know, if you're going to be in an area where you think, you know, you're, you're going to be exposed, um, you know, the bug spray, like off, you know, anything with DEET in it, those kind of things will, will help, uh, uh, you know, help prevent you to some degree, at least from, from getting mosquito bites. But I, I think we all know in the summer that it's almost unavoidable to, to at least end up with some. Yeah. And then what are some of the um, diseases that could happen from a bite? Um, are they common around here? So, so they, so yes and no, sort of. So um, there, there are kind of four diseases that the mosquitoes in our area can have. Uh, West Nile is one that, that, you know, has gotten a lot of publicity. Uh, there's one called St. Louis encephalitis, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, and lacrosse encephalitis. Uh, and encephalitis, you know, means inflammation in the central nervous system, you know, in the brain. Now, that is really, really pretty rare. Um, these, uh, these diseases, uh, you know, when you talk about are they rare or are they prevalent, um, there, there is some prevalence, but actually a lot of times um, they are asymptomatic. So a lot of times, you know, if you get bit by a mosquito that carries these, most people who are not immunocompromised, uh, you know, aren't going to, you know, end up having any symptoms and, you know, your body kind of just fights it off by itself. Um, 
But in patients who are, you know, immunocompromised, which is a lot of our patients in rheumatology because of the medicines we put them on, uh, sometimes, you know, we can see, you know, the more severe, you know, kind of manifestations there. Uh, but in general, those those things are pretty rare. And then, you know, outside of our area, uh, you know, are kind of the, the more worrisome things with mosquitoes. So if you travel to uh, you know, the Caribbean or Central South America, there are other things that go along there. Uh, it's been in the news that there's actually been a few sporadic cases of malaria actually in Florida and Texas. Uh, that's kind of still at the point where, you know, even if you're going to those areas, I don't know that uh, that's something to be, you know, super concerned with, but, uh, you know, definitely something that we're, you know, kind of keeping an eye on there. Yeah, I saw we got something about it was like, it's rising, but don't worry about it yet. Like, what does that <laughs> yeah. Mean? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that it's at the point where you need yeah. malaria prophylaxis, like if you go to Africa or somewhere like that. Yeah. But yeah. but it's definitely, you know, something to, you know, that we need to be mindful of and, and, and kind of just monitor at this point. Well, that was pretty much everything that I had in my questions. Was there anything else that um, you had to, you wanted to add before I let you go? I think, uh, you know, uh, with, with most of these things, you know, uh, Prevention is the biggest thing. Like I said, with mosquitoes, standing water is 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 the big thing. Um, uh, with ticks, uh, you know, they're they're here, right? You know, so Ohio actually is not one of the states that you know kind of typically falls into that. It's more northeast, but Pennsylvania, West Virginia are, and we're you know in this part of Ohio, we're right on the border with those. Uh, so you know, I've seen you know several cases of of Lyme disease this summer already. So uh, while we maybe don't always think of Ohio, certainly our area, you know, it's, it's, it's there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for all the information. Okay. And um, I will let you know when my story's up. It should be, should be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great.